I believe what's happening also is that I have invited a lot of people with a link that was sent to me, which are showing up as my name coming through, but that's fine. It's just me coming through the camera, but they're using my link and I feel like I have three people. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. We're going to get started in a couple minutes. I just wanted to acknowledge your presence. Um, we'll get started shortly, thank you. Hi again, everyone. I just want to thank you for being patient. You're going to get started in a couple of minutes. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm just going to go through some really, really quick housekeeping before we get started. So tonight we're here to learn more about the Roger Williams Park Gateway Center. I should introduce myself. So my name is Catherine Hippolyte. I'm the Director of Communications for the Providence Department of Planning and Development. Um, first off, I just want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded um, and will be available on our website in a couple of days. And I should let you know that while you're able to see my face and you'll be able to see our other panelists today, your video has been disabled um, and you've also been automatically muted. Spanish interpretation will be provided tonight. So if you locate the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a small globe with the word interpretation. Uh, please just make sure you select if you'd like to hear the presentation in English or in Spanish. Um, each participant, no matter what they'd like to hear the uh, event in, needs to click one to be able to hear the presentation clearly. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say that there is a question and answer window available for you to type your questions in that we will address during the question and answer period after the presentation. Um, you can also use that chat window that I referenced if you're having any technical issues during the meeting, and I will do my very best uh, to troubleshoot on my end. Um, that basically covers all of the housekeeping items. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the meeting over to um, Wendy Nielsen. She's the park superintendent and she will get us started. Uh, Wendy, take it away. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, this is really an exciting, um, exciting event tonight. Um, we have been working with our partners at the Rhode Island Foundation, DEM, um, and most recently the Roger Williams Park Conservancy to invest over $11 million in the revitalization of Roger Williams Park through its building improvements, stormwater and water quality improvements, roads, recreation, and, and so much more. Um, throughout this process, we shared um, updates and solicited ideas at community meetings and neighborhood meetings. And through five years of these meetings, the most requested improvement was a better and more genuine connection to the surrounding neighborhoods. It was with that that the idea for the uh, the vision for uh, the gateway was born to better connect the park to the Broad Street neighborhoods and also better connect the Broad Street neighborhoods to the park. Uh, I think we, when we first looked at this, we were looking at, we wanted people to see um, who were leaving the park and entering the Broad Street neighborhood to see the, the visitor center as a lens through which they could uh, view Broad Street and all it has to offer. And the same for um, coming from Broad Street to be able to view the park and all that it has um, available also. So um, it's, it's been a really exciting time. Uh, we have been working really closely um, on this project uh, with the Department of Planning and Development and the fabulous director, Bonnie Nickerson. Bonnie, this is all you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, thank you, Catherine, and thanks to all of you for joining the meeting this evening. Um, as Wendy said, this has been a long process and we're so excited to share the progress with you tonight. Um, there are so many exciting projects happening in every neighborhood in our city right now, even during this challenging time that we're all living in. There's a significant amount of investment happening throughout the city. And I am a little biased, but I do have to say of all the projects underway, there isn't one that will be as big of a transformation as this project will be. The Gateway Center will be built near the Broad Street entrance to the park. And as Wendy was saying, it's really going to serve as a gateway to the park and as a gateway from the park to the neighborhood and be that, real, that gateway that the Broad Street community and that Broad Street deserves. Um, historically, that, that gateway has been on the Elmwood Avenue side of the park, but on the Broad Street side, um, we've always sort of lacked that same sort of, of gateway. Um, so over the past decade, as you all know very well, this site has been a vacant, abandoned eyesore. But what you are going to see take shape over the next year is a remarkable transformation to a bright and welcoming beacon in our community. Um, and really the intent is not just to be a gateway, but to be a gathering place and a resource for all the South Side neighborhoods. Um, so back in December of 2018, the Providence Redevelopment Agency purchased this site 
And then last fall, as many of you will remember, we hosted a design competition and received proposals from many excellent teams, all with really interesting and creative ideas of how to reimagine the site. Um, we met at Bones Theater and we displayed all of these ideas and we received an incredible amount of feedback and ultimately selected Inform Studio as the winner. So tonight we are going to hear from the Inform Studio design team. But before we do, I would like to welcome our mayor, Jorge Alorza, to say a few words. Mayor Alorza. Well, thank you, Bonnie. And thank you, everybody uh, um, who's joining us for this. We really appreciate your participation. And I can't wait to just hear your thoughts and get your feedback on this project and perhaps how we can improve it uh, here going forward. So, you know, all thanks in this go to uh, three groups. You know, our folks in planning, our folks in, in the parks department, and our folks in the community. You know, we've really tried to do all of the work along Broad Street and throughout the city um, in conjunction with the community. So uh, I'll hand it back in just a second, but what I'd like to do is just situate these investments uh, within a, a much wider and broader investments that we've made along the, the Broad Street corridor. You know, and, that, and this runs the length. So coming from, uh, from uh, um, uh, Roger Williams Park, you know, we've also uh, uh, worked with private developers actually to develop the Bone Theater and the building next door, which is now El Ninja. And if you haven't been there for some Dominican inspired sushi, I recommend that you try it. It is so, so good. Um, just before that, actually, we had the formerly abandoned Quisquea and Acción property. And that was really derelict and falling apart for a number of years, but uh, that's been knocked on and we're well on our way to putting housing in, in that space. We've also worked with many of the businesses and the residents to put more trash cans and recycling bins all along that Broad Street corridor. And as, uh, and as you go along Broad Street, our, our investments continue. Uh, we uh, are making a massive investment along with Rhode Island Housing in the Barbara Jordan, Barbara Jordan 2 properties. Those are the those are the 27 uh, contiguous abandoned properties in Upper Broad Street, and the city is going to make a major public infrastructure investment in that as well. And so, what we want to do is make sure that Broad Street is a place that we all feel proud of. It's our Broad Street because it's one of our main streets. It's the center of um, life for many in the Latino and the African American community. And it should really be a showpiece of our city. When folks come to our city, they want to see our Broad Street. We want to show them the very best, but also for our neighbors that live there. And, uh, you know, they, they, they want nothing, nothing but the best for their neighborhoods. You know, we believe here in our city that no one should have to move to live in a better neighborhood. So we want to create that right here uh, in Broad Street uh, throughout our city. So we're fully committed to inv this investment. Um, you know, I'm used to seeing this abandoned, uh, burnt down building for too many years in our, in our city. I can't wait to see it come down and see this beautiful other structure come in that's going to help us bring community together. So I'll pause there. I'll hand it back to the team. And uh, I want to just thank everybody for participating and being part of this today. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mayor. So I'm really excited to introduce our project lead. Um, Pandush Gachi is the project manager and architect on the Gateway. And I'll also be introducing Adam Anderson, who is the landscape architect. So I'm going to just kick it right to Pandush to um, guide us through the Gateway. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, mm -hmm. So greetings from Michigan. Uh, my name is Pandush Gachi, the project architect, as she mentioned. Um, or William, Roger Williams Park Gateway Center. Um, I'm honored to present this project with our design team from Design Under Sky, um, which is the landscape uh, designer, the Atlantis uh, Design Structural GIA for Civil and uh, Green Path Design Mechanical on their behalf, of course, because they couldn't be in this meeting and with tremendous efforts from the Providence Redevelopment Agency and the Parks Department and everybody involved that is making this project possible. Uh, the ultimate drivers for this project's development really 
So I'd like to thank everyone here, as well as all the other team members that couldn't make it. Uh, and we couldn't fit on the page that uh, I'm going to show right here. So I am, I am this guy right in the second row here, the second column. And uh, this is my lovely wife. Um, so moving forward, the project site is situated at the original uh, El Fogon site, uh, which is a, in the city of Providence, aims to develop into a welcoming gateway for residents and visitors to serve as a strategic catalytic, catalytic um, investment uh, for broad and positive impact, I mean, really citywide. And the Roger Williams Park Gateway Center um, marks the project site as a midpoint of the cultural uh, corridor that began to form almost 60 years ago. Uh, and that area that once was a home to large Jewish and Irish populations has slowly transformed into a uh, bustling Latino community and it's still keep it's still growing and it's uh, giving a lot of its identity to uh, the street itself so these uh, these communities were have deeply believed in in their identity inclusivity and sustainability and we all know that as as immigrants uh, one being myself we are very uh, interested in, in being sustainable and we are very interested in keeping our identity and we're being uh, very inclusive to all races, people, ages, etc. So uh, we really truly believe in this project and we really truly believe in what this project can do for the community. The three principles that I just mentioned, uh, the identity, inclusivity, and sustainability were also the driving principles that we uh, set out to explore in this project, uh, going back as far to the competition uh, time last year. And we also found out that in our research, you know, these three principles align closely with the mission of Roger Williams Park Conservancy, which is going to be one of the tenants in this uh, building facility. And those, that mission uh, states to sustain and enhance Roger Williams Park as a vibrant public place for all. And I believe that this project is setting out to do that. So in this image of um, stating identity, and there's two uh, very sort of similar images taken 61 years apart. And to the left, we have the festival chorus at the Benedict Temple to Music, uh, circa 1925. Um, and then there is a, a July 4th celebration happening in 1986, which was incidentally the year that I was born. Uh, the, I'm really old, as you can see, <laughs> but I'm very grateful to actually talk a little bit about these two images, because what they do is they imbue this um, same feeling of uh, what makes us all human, which is compassion, creativity, and freedom of expression. So I would like to kind of take that idea and move forward to explain a little bit about all the other things that happen in, these, uh, in this park that ultimately is considered the people's park. And, you know, be it from the boots of the ground memorial installation that happens to honor the heroes to other perennial um, festivals of classical music with a backdrop of the temple of music. Um, so with that, they, they all do the same thing, which is create an example for what public space truly is and truly what the public space can provide. These moments in history collectively shared at the People's Park and Broad Street at large have provided glimpses into our humanity. Public space is a forum for discourse, discourse and freedom, um, but both must be you know, cherished and protected. During the early stages of the project, we came uh, upon these vintage postcards uh, commemorating Providence as a city and the Roger Williams Park and the National Museum of History as well. And um, we use them and others, obviously, as inspiration to connect the past uh, with the present. We felt this very strongly because uh, we wanted to lay the foundation for designing something that will live far into the future becoming a monument to those values uh, in its own right as a project. So this slide showcasing, for example, uh, PVD Fest and many other cultural festivals adorning beautiful colors, pack Broad Street uh, perennially, 
well, multiple times a year, I think. And I think I've seen some crazy numbers where it says that you guys have 187 types of festivals in the city in, uh, throughout 365 days, which to me is amazing. And we want to promote that with adding to this axis of fun uh, by creating a, a project that um, brings the same energy you know, to the city and the community uh, by visiting the site and the project in the Gateway Center. One of the main ideas uh, that was born uh, with the help of our uh, principal, uh, Michael Guthrie, that uh, was in that slideshow, and uh, between Corey and I and many others in our firm, we, have, uh, we, we sought to seek the bright colors from the facades of the businesses adorning uh, Broad Street, north and south of the site, uh, to uh, we kind of analyze and saw that this was definitely the uh, marking factor, the character and the vibrancy that was found in those facades goes deeper, obviously, than the surface. And we wanted to pay homage um, to those colors. And we wanted to bring those into the project. So we focused on the businesses, but we also focused on the colors of those festivals. And those became a, an array of multicolored things that welcome all people. So as you can see, we took all of those facades and kind of extracted the colors and we wanted to use them directly on the project because we wanted every single one of them to be representative, represented in this project and to sort of have a little bit of ownership of it as well, just like we want the community to do so as well. Conceptually, this new gateway threshold will always be open um, as a model for inclusivity for potential visitors and neighborhood residents, of course. It will accommodate food trucks, so it'll be sort of like the place where you need to go and catch, uh, you know, uh, the festival if you want, while you're kind of like, or the parade, but at the same time, you can uh, truly enjoy all the amenities and facilities that are provided within the site itself. This project is removing paved surface uh, significantly from the city and returning it to uh, the public as an amenity. The Gateway Center aims to improve the lens through which par the park uh, visitors see Washington Park and in its vicinity, the neighborhood, and its surroundings, but at the same time, how they see themselves in relation to the park. We've developed these experiences, experiential renderings to showcase a little bit of what to expect uh, in the neighborhood. And as you can see, we want this to be something that is a beacon at night as well. This is not just something that the colors fade, but they kind of become brighter and uh, more um, vibrant as the night goes along. And it still, it becomes a beacon for all the community to be proud of. In conjunction with other park views to showcase the atmosphere expected, we have some site views and uh, close-ups to the amenities, that we will, which we will show further in the presentation. So uh, the site is located next to Roger Williams Park, and I want to make that distinction because this, um, uh, this will be sort of the stopping point for all the activity that goes on, you know, as you're trying to, to, to reach the destination of Roger Williams Park. So inviting visitors to celebrate this incredible public asset is instrumental in its success. And following various transit, bike, pedestrian routes, uh, there are many cultural and trace educational retail destinations along Broad Street, uh, coming from all the way to downtown to Roger Williams Park. We, it was paramount that we created the destination and not just a pit stop. And to do so, we wanted to create, uh, to give it an identity as well, and to do so through the means of the different features and amenities provided within this site. So for example, like the water retention, the educational opportunities provided by the Gateway Center, all you know, are fundamental drivers and organizers of the site's design. Uh, there are tools that we employed into like how we're going to uh, de derive something that everybody could benefit from that was economical, that was sophisticated, and it provide, gave back a lot to the community. So gather 
play and discover were three ideas that we closely looked at uh, with Adam in conjunction with um, uh, with all of the conversations that we've had. Uh, we wanted to achieve something that would closely align with uh, Providence Park's recreation slogan of play, relax, and explore. And these two are, albeit not in the same order, um, they are profound principles. So they were organized to, they were used to organize the layout of the site so that we have this urban to wild concept as you get deeper and deeper uh, towards the beer. And that is, this transition is also seen through the forms, but at the same time, the density of the vegetation and the wildlife that takes over um, technically on the north end of the site, which is in this presentation at the south right here. To explain a bit, explain a bit further, I'm inviting project landscape architect Adam Anderson to speak to the different amenities and site components found on the park areas of the project. Adam, any time that you want to uh, me to click and continue, please do so. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bandush. Yeah, you know, um, Roger Williams Park in itself plays such a such a critical role to the surrounding area to really bringing nature into the into the city. And um, certainly, as a landscape architect, I know uh, how how important that really is. So. We wanted to, to do that, but also create a, a, a nice community transition into a, into a, a more a natural environment to kind of uh, represent that um, aspect of, of the park itself. So these three these three kind of gathered concepts of gather, play, uh, discover is is really the the gathers at the street. It's more of a hard surface area where there's it allows for a a variety of different events to take place. So it's, it's sort of malleable in, in how it is able to be to be used and sort of a, a nice transition from the streetscape uh, into the park. But as you're moving back, it, it begins to the, the, the wildness or nature sort of emerges as you move in. And, and we're talking about incorporating natural uh, play uh, aspects of, um, of that and this, and if you go back one more, Prandush. Um, so this, you know, there's, uh, sorry, you can go to the, yeah, uh, yeah. So here we're, you know, we're looking at lar larger, when we're allowed to gather again in larger groups, um, uh, an opportunity for a range of different kind of events and maybe they're movable tables and those can go away and then, and then another kind of event can happen. Um, next, please. And then as we move back, there's, um, um, you know, there's sculptural play mounds that, that emerge out of, uh, you know, stormwater retention and, and natural logs that cross that. So it allows you to experience this natural landscape um, in a sort of fun and unique way. Plenty of uh, seating areas under trees to, uh, you know, parents can watch their kids enjoy um, really a, a beautiful and kind of unique uh, kind of uh, nature in, in this area. Um, and, then, and then as you're moving back into the site, um, really the, the landscape becomes stronger and more uh, robust. And, and we see this as an opportunity to actually have more of a learning landscape where, where uh, you know, there's signage and other opportunities for, for folks of young and old to really uh, engage with the landscape and begin to um, uh, not just enjoy it, but actually learn about what there is that they're seeing and learn about nature and ecology uh, within, our, within our city. So there's a wide range of, of, of ways to enjoy this, this you know, really natural area. Um, these are just some of the, some of the kind of uh, atmospheric images of how, how we're seeing this to unfold. This is looking at the, the kind of wild area. So there's still opportunities to play and engage with natural, uh, natural features with, with a lot of trees that we think will, will introduce uh, wildlife. And then the, you know, the gathering area where, you know, all are welcome and, and it again provides an opportunity um, um, for, the, for the community to really kind of step in, um, naturally engage the site with, with a wide range of activities, programmatic activities happening.
Thank you, Adam. Um, I'll just uh, I'm going to continue a little bit more and explain how the uh, entryway and sort of the front of the site has uh, come about and it's, it's in its development. So. The Creative Visitor Center as a destination encourages new potential for patronage of these numerous businesses. So additionally, we'll introduce amenities and services to invigorate, encourage, expand the rich uh, cultural identities of the community as well as becoming a catalyst for, for economic growth for Broad Street and uh, Washington Park at large. In this slide, I'm, I've kind of delineated a few of the features and how we came about uh, to um, these design decisions. Uh, for example, um, the materials chosen for this project have been carefully curated and to produce a facility that is understated, budget conscious, and versatile. The recycled content was not the only factor when we chose these materials. and um, and equipment, of course, too. And with their long-term environmental performance and architectural impact, we wanted to assess um, all of those ideas. And that way we could create a project that the strength, durability, and elegance uh, built in. With longevity of, of this project being paramount, we wanted to reduce the need for frequent maintenance as well and replacement, which keeps the cost down. Oh, I would like to point out that some of the sort of design decisions that you see here, including this monumental sort of left piece, um, was undertaken uh, with a lot of good intention in mind. So it relies heavily on functionality and not necessarily on the, on the aesthetics of the project. We don't truly Design for aesthetics, which are designed to create something that is not just beautiful, but it primarily serves the purpose in which um, it's it's uh, it was uh, directed to. So the gateway height, for example, allows for food trucks to come through, and we wanted it to be as clear as possible while also keeping views to the rear of the site and the tree line uh, as open and as accessible to the people's eye. Uh, the building geometric form that you see to the left um, is provides shelter by neatly tucking in the underside and kind of creating this sort of a peak in which you can stand underneath while you're uh, traversing or trying to enter the building. At the same time, the volume inside is all used for all the mechanical and storage uh, place needed for this small 1,500 square foot facility. Um, the cladding material shown uh, on the first, like sort of at the, the left and in the first image here is a, is considered an ultra impact surface material, which is very durable, obviously, and very aesthetically pleasing. And it draws parallels to this long lasting and monumental limestone that is found in all the facilities that are at Roger Williams Park. And we did this a lot, we did this a lot with a lot of different uh, cues. We always threw it back to the past with an intent to create something contemporary to the future. And the wood screen, for example, sorry, uh, kind of skipping here, uh, represents this um, in our interprets, I guess, the tree line that we see within Roger Williams Parks. And, and uh, at the same time, it becomes a privacy screen. We want people that are inside the facility to not be to not feel watched at, and also to not have certain views uh, distracting. So, in the, in so many ways, this opens up slightly in a gradient as you traverse from the front of the building to the rear, and that is uh, meant to bring some of that nature inside the building as well by opening up the the screen and it, as it becomes less dense, we are providing direct views in the park areas for any, you know, children playing or all of the gatherings that could happen in that site, maintaining direct contact for multiple reasons, obviously. So 
this is just more uh, kind of exploration of the interior finishes for the facility and we wanted to keep this as simple and clean and minimalist as possible with uh, with a main focus of maintenance free but also functionality so the gallery's polished concrete floor finish for example just eases arrangement of partitions and furniture and any other equipment uh, creating a flexible space uh, for both civic and I did say private events. The gallery can be divided into zones as well, which um, here's the floor plan. It's very simple. We have mechanical storage, gallery, restrooms, um, you know, a sales counter for any ticketing or you know park information for any visitor. And then there is a patio to the back as well. And that patio uh, is meant to create this sort of like a threshold um, transition between the building and the exterior. And to help do that, we create, we've added the operable walls um, at the rear, which can be opened fully. And that, again, is um, meant to create this uh, blurred boundary of in, indoor and outdoor um, facilities. Gatherings be it educational, commercial, or civic, take a different atmosphere with a backdrop of trees permeating the understated interior. And we, we did this with intent to, to bring in school buses of, of children and, and students and, you know, adults alike to create this like more of immersive experience where nature kind of flows in and out and, and it creates this single singular path from the entryway to the back of the park as a tour. Um, so, with that, we, we did not forget that creating a, a small building, we also needed to make it sustainable. An image, sort of an exponential image depicting how that lush green um, backdrop, you know, sort of comes in even without opening uh, the operable wall at the, at the rear while creating very flexible space that could transition from, you know, private workspace to large events. So keeping in line with the green initiative set by the city of Providence uh, and its goals to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, bravo, uh, this project will be no different in rigorously implementing long proven technologies um, I mean, they are, we want to use something that has been proven that will provide um, overall carbon footprint shrinkage. We wanted to provide, uh, we wanted to minimize energy use and uh, have uh, be ecologically conscious in the process of designing it. So some of the technologies not depicted in the project would be the um, uh, dual cavity aluminum thermally insulated storefront uh, which is a mouthful to say, obviously, and that uh, delivers high performance and energy efficiency uh, for the building. And that way, we also maintain direct views uh, to outside without the trade-offs of energy efficiency. It would be very easy to create a building that's just a box without a lot of windows and openings to see outside. But what is the purpose of actually creating a center, a welcoming center, if we can't be welcoming with the materials we choose? So to minimize heating and cooling needs, we have added electrical HVAC uh, units, not fossil fuel uh, powered ones for that same reason. We were trying to be sustain sustainable um, and um, definitely environmental friendly. During the warmer months, for example, uh, operable windows will take advantage of the summer breezes because it's a such small space. The gallery is about a thousand square feet. And then during the winter months, we will use this electric HVAC system to, which is definitely uh, going to be sufficient and compact. It will be out of the eye uh, of the visitors. It will be, you know, tucked away but it will, uh, com combined with all these other technologies, it will dim further diminish any heating and cooling needs. So in this slide that I've left up, uh, we have this chart in the corner, which basically shows how an efficient system of solar panels or array would sort of compensate between the 
the cold overcast months of the winter and then by having a lot of production and energy in the summer months where we have sunny days. And then as you can see, within three years, this uh, system pays for itself and then it just keeps paying. So this is a very uh, good sustainable initiative that gets us closer to that average net zero initiative that we internally sought out to achieve. In addition to the, uh, the addition to the, of the solar panels will also um, contribute to many other things uh, with regard to the lighting and other site features because we've, we've tied the system um, completely and ultimately we, we see this as an example of what could be done into the future. Um, the, so this slide depicts a little bit the stormwater management that has been implemented as part of the site design, but it, it technically starts from the building itself. Any water that you know, comes from the both roofs of the facility would actually flow through this trench drain, for example, and then uh, continue uh, its path into the rain gardens and kind of feed those lush places of you know, wildlife and native plants as well. So it employs this passive water system, but it also works in conjunction with the reduction of uh, site uh, pervious, uh, I mean, impervious surface. And we've reduced impervious surface by 80%. And we did that uh, with uh, the intent to uh, utilize as much as we could of the site. When we think about stormwater management, uh, planting and, and, um, and trees are super important. So with that, we have closely, we've introduced about 14 different uh, native species of trees and like eight different versions of brushes and, and perennials. And I think Adam can speak more to that uh, if you'd like. But it ultimately becomes a resource for learning. And every single initiative that we have on this uh, green initiative that we have on the site will have signage appropriate for learning and depicting all of these um, uh, initiatives that are ongoing already at Roger Williams Park, but at the same time will be happening on this gateway uh, park as well. Adam? No, I, th I think <clears throat> that that sounds good, Pandush. I think you know two of the things that that work with this is it is a it is a um it's a native landscape it's it's a sculpturally designed landscape but it's also a functioning uh landscape so when we talk about you know ecosystem and and plant systems and stormwater i think it's all all tied into a into a, a park that's going to be not only beautiful but beautifully functioning and and what we hope that that does is it helps um, uh, people learn more about uh, you know their their surrounding nature and and become more inspired by that and uh, you know take take something away so um, it's a place where you can enjoy but also learn and 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 gather with friends and family in, in this place as well so um, the the combination of of um, uh, plants that we're using all you know the the reduction of maintenance by using um, uh, native native plants and and working with wildflower and meadow seed mix is all um, a way that you know we're interested in, in reducing the energy involved in, in taking care of this so that it actually becomes sort of uh, you know self self functioning with with time thanks Adam um, so even though this brings us to sort of the end of the presentation, um, I'd like to say a few words about the actual uh, sort of schedule of things and how what we're seeing, we're trying to see uh, coming up on this project. This project has been in development for almost a year now. And um, I, the last time that, um, that this was presented was uh, some six months back and this was uh, as part of the 
uh, initiative to uh, go through plan review and, and certain other standard zoning reviews uh, as required by any, any project that's trying to break the mold of, of design uh, along Broad Street, for example. So what we're expecting to see is uh, some work to begin work immediately this fall and, and with further construction continuing in spring 2021. We hope that um, you know some of these images, when they're taken, when they're photographed, when the project is done, can become postcards as well. And uh, maybe other people can draw inspiration in those postcards so that uh, we continue the legacy that was started on Broad Street with uh, civil rights marches to the festivals that are ongoing today um, and uh, celebrating the culture of the people it will serve. So I'd like to conclude by saying what an honor it has been working on this project uh, for me personally. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, I know that as a son of a first uh, generation immigrant, um, I have been on a personal journey and uh, learning and introspection, and I've met wonderful people that that are always going to be my friends just because of this project and i've learned so much and i believe that uh, just like it brought us together when we were working on this project this project itself will bring people together um, closer in the future so thank you thank you pandush that was really quite lovely um uh we have been working with the mayor's latino ambassador group um uh for a, a little bit now. And um, from that, a subcommittee was created to act as an advisory who will work to uh, make the new center an integral part of the neighborhood and the neighborhood an integral uh, part of the park. Uh, Pedro Pablo de la Rosa is an architect who has lived in Providence for 18 years and currently owns a construction company, Architectural Solutions General Construction LLC. Um, and uh, Pedro kindly volunteered to talk about the context of the visitor center in the neighborhood, the potential impact it can have on the way of life in the Broad Street communities. So uh, I welcome Pedro Pablo de la Rosa. There you are. I think you're mute. You're off mute, Pedro. You can go ahead. I think we're having slight technical uh, difficulties there. We're going to go straight to the Q&A. If anyone has any questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen.
Doesn't look like we have any questions. Oh, here we go. Okay, they're coming in now. Uh, uh, Rachel um, has a question here. Do we have a view of the project from the back, uh, standing in the park and looking towards Broad? Andush, do you have a rendering of that? Can you make sure you unmute yourself, please? Apologies, it has happened before. Um, I'd like to say that we have some renderings uh, that depict at least some of these images that are not necessarily the same uh, type of rendering as we've shown at the end or at the beginning, but they do depict quite nicely what the experience is gonna be like looking outward towards that. So it's gonna be a very lush experience, um, but, uh, it will differ slightly from like phase from the front gather to the play area to the discover um, sort of stages of the site. I wonder if these are something that uh, do it for you guys. There you go. Yeah, I might also say from the image of the of the back is you know what we are trying to do with the planting is that the you know safety is has has been a key topic for our discussion. So, you know, in the back, we're looking at the, the tree canopy is it will be high enough in the lower planting low enough where, you know, visual um, cues throughout the site will still be, um, you know, strong enough to, you know, to main that, maintain that aspect. So it's, it's, it's not disconnected from the rest of the site, but still, um, you know, very, very green, but, you know, it's very much a part of everything. Thank you. Uh, CJ asks, um, how do the designers see this project enhancing the walkability of the neighborhood? Anyone on the panel would be great to open that up to. Uh, I can probably get help from all my uh, team here to answer this question, but there are multiple ways in which this project can uh, benefit uh, pedestrians. Ultimately, we wanted this to be a destination, as I mentioned in the presentation. So uh, the vehicle access to this site, for example, is very limited. And we would do that only for, the, for uh, utility maintenance, maybe. Uh, we do that for food trucks, but we don't allow parking on site. And we are promoting this idea of, uh, of walkability, but also pedestrian um, use of bicycles and you know biking along Broad Street as one of the bike routes actually happens to be just at the end of the block. Uh, I do wonder, so by limiting the vehicles, we are definitely forcing pedestrians to take, uh, uh, you know, visiting this on foot. However, it's not the only way to reach this. We also hope that this project promotes other developing projects to take up this sort of um, ethos of pedestrian walkability over vehicle and parking and adding hard, more hard tops to the city of Providence. The only way that, um, that I believe that the connection would happen would be through the sidewalk, which is seeing a, um, a large chunk of it being repaved and completed alongside with the city walk initiatives. Uh, ongoing on Broad Street. Thank you, Pandush. Um, our next question is, what is the anticipated completion date for the project? Bonnie, I'm gonna hand that over to you. Thank you. So I think Pandush went through the project schedule that um, this fall you'll start to see some site work and there'll be a construction bid issued this winter. So in early spring, we'll begin the actual construction of the building itself. Um, I will check with the team to see what they would anticipate the total construction time being, but I'm going to say that by the end of um, the fall of next year, the, the project will be complete and Pandush will tell me if I got that wrong. 
Well, uh, Bonnie, you've made it impossible now not to deliver it uh, by that time. So I thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the next question from Susan is, does the project site connect directly to Roger Williams Park? Brian Burns, Deputy Superintendent of Parks in the City of Providence, that's all yours. Uh, so it does connect. Um, it connects directly. Um, they abut each other and um, it will welcome you into the park through the city sidewalk, which will put you right into the area closest to the ball fields, the tennis courts, and the large grass areas that are the medium in, in the uh, entrance to the park. So there is a connection um, both physically and um, emotionally for a lot of people. And to clarify, there is not, once you're in the site, there is not a direct access into the park. There's a very steep grade there. So the access would be through the, um, the sidewalk. Thanks, thank you. Um, next question from Doris. Will vehicle traffic into the park from Broad Street be completely eliminated? So, like I mentioned earlier, the only access uh, vehicles to vehicles will be for food trucks and utility equipment maintenance type of um, vehicles. We won't, we don't want to promote this, um, uh, you know, vehicle parking on the site. This is made for pedestrians. We want children to be safe. We've used materials in which are benefiting pedestrian, um, you know, traffic and all of the features involved in selection of materials, the green, space and whatnot, but uh, we're trying to move away from that and we're trying to promote this uh, uh, type of, you know, more healthy uh, sort of project living. We want that to also become an example for other projects as well. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that we could, I mean, vehicles could uh, actually uh, drive into the site all the way to the rear, but that is prohibited. There are uh, bollards that are collapsible across the front entry, and they were not depicted in the renderings. Um, but basically, they are stainless steel, and they uh, become physical barriers to vehicles coming in at any point when there's events or any type of, um, um, I should say, activity that can happen on Broad Street or in, in the actual gateway center itself. And Hawthorne and Miller streets will still be open, so those will not be impacted at all, and you will still be able to drive into the park from Broad Street as you always have. This is just a nice little stop on the way. Um, are there any other questions? We're going to try connect. Oh, one more. Are there any special provisions with people? with walking difficulties such as wheelchairs, motorized or manual, crutches and the like? Great question. I, this is a great question. So when we sought out to create a project that was inclusive and uh, embodied the identity of the community and the sustainability, all those things kind of work together and we wanted to achieve a truly universal, um, you know, um, access, accessible site. So even though the materials are organic in nature and they are, you know, uh, maybe crushed aggregate and such, they are um, stabilized in such a way that you could uh, traverse the whole site with on a wheelchair, on crutches, or any type of, um, you know, disability um, of, of uh, you know, physical disability. So we were very conscious of that. The facility itself. Um, the building provides, you know, pad um, entries, so it's going to be accessible on both uh, the front and the rear. And there are no thresholds to cross other than quarter inch heights, so it makes it very easy for um, for anybody to access at any any corner of uh, of the building itself and the site area. The whole plaza at the front is universal. Uh, ADA accessible, and uh, I'm very proud that this project became that. I think um, Sally also added, what is the total distance from the front to the back and is it walkable? The total distance is 326 meet, um, feet, which is not a lot. And 140 of that would be the 
front sort of expansion um, of the entryway. And um, th these are very walkable distances for sure. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, somebody else made a comment, uh, anti ATV bollards um, would be appropriate. And I think this team concurs with that. Um, I would like to try uh, welcoming uh, uh, Pedro Pablo De La Rosa one more time. Pedro, are you able to join us? Oh, we see you, but we're not hearing you, Pedro. So Pedro, unfortunately, we're not able to hear you. I think what we can uh, we can do is that we can share Pedro's remarks with the presentation so that um, everyone's able to hear um, what Pedro um, has to say about this project and its um, its connection to the community, which is incredibly important. So on that note, I'm going to hand it back to you, Bonnie, to wrap us up. Great. Thank you so much, Wendy, and to the team. As you can see, uh, we're really excited about this project and really excited to get it going. Um, we welcome any additional questions or comments that you have. Um, this, as we said, this presentation will be posted. Um, so please send it to anyone that you know who wasn't able to join us tonight. It'll be on our website and we will make sure a link is available. Um, also, you can contact Wendy or myself and we'll make sure that you have that information as well, how to get in touch with us. If you have a question as we leave here tonight and realized you, you uh, forgot to ask your question, please reach out to us and I think the important part is we really see this as the beginning of the dialogue with the community to make sure that this space truly is a neighborhood hub that that serves the needs of the community. And so again, thank you so much for spending the time with us tonight and we look forward to continuing to work together as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.